So, all, all done. Okay, so let me start the recording and... Uh, um... Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Weina, I'm an assistant professor at the CMU and I'm going to be the host today. Uh, so first uh, let me start by briefly mentioning some of the logistics. Uh, so please mute yourself uh, during the talk unless like you're asking a question, uh, but you are encouraged to turn on your videos so we can see more faces. And uh, um, the, the, the talk will be recorded and it is being live streamed on YouTube. If you don't want your video to uh, appear here, you can simply mute yourself or, and turn off your video, or you can head over to, uh, uh, to YouTube to watch the talk. And uh, um, so uh, if you have questions during the talk, you can post your questions in the chat box. So uh, previously we would like uh, relay the uh, questions to the speaker, but today we are actually very glad to have a co-author Aaron join us. And Aaron is going to answer the questions in the chat box. And uh, uh, also like the speaker will pause several times during the talk for questions. And there will be also a Q&A session at the end. So you can ask more um, like longer questions. Um, okay, so the slides are on the web, uh, SNAP website, and I'm also going to post the link in the chat box so you can look at the slides. Okay, uh, um, and also, like, I think there's a quick announcement. We will not be having a SNAP seminar next week, and we will come back the, the week after. Okay, so uh, today we are really excited to have Professor David Gamanek join us from MIT. Uh, David is a Nanyang Technological University Professor of Operations Research at the Operations Research and the Statistics Group uh, in the uh, Sloan uh, School of Management of uh, uh, MIT. Uh, he received the uh, BA in Mathematics from New York University in 1993 and a PhD in Operations Research from MIT in 1998. Since then, he was a research staff member uh, of IBM T.J. Watson Research Center before he joined the MIT in 2005. So his research interests include the probability uh, theory of random graphs, optimization and algorithms, statistics and machine learning, uh, stochastic processes, and the queuing theory. He's a recipient of the Erlang Prize and the Best Publication Award from the Applied Probability Society of Informs. And he was a finalist for the Franz Eidelman Prize at competition of INFORMS. So in the past, he served as an area editor of Operations Research Journal and then associate editor of Mathematics of uh, OR and also of Applied Probability, Queuing Systems and Stochastic Systems Journals. So uh, today he will be talking about the algorithmic barriers in random number partitioning problem. So let's welcome David and uh, David, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Weina, Siva, every, uh, everyone, organizers, and uh, uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure also to reconnect with, with friends and colleagues, and I hope that uh, we will reconnect at some near time uh, soon uh, in, in more you know, peaceful times, post-COVID times. Um, I'm going to talk about today uh, um, uh, on a joint work with Aaron Kiseldak, who is, uh, as, as was announced, is in the audience, will respond to ch by chat. So all the difficult questions that uh, are going to have, I'm going to quickly sort of redirect to him and he'll be able to address that. And he will also keep me honest if I make any mistakes. This is the first time I'm presenting this work. So I apologize in advance. The slides are likely to contain typos, mistakes, and, and things like that. Uh, the topic, uh, the narrow topic of, of this talk is the uh, number partitioning problem in a random environment, but it's actually, in some ways, the talk is above and beyond that. It's actually about the bigger challenges, and the challenges have to do with how do we think about optimization and random structures and challenges that come across when we do that, and how do we understand those challenges from the algorithmic perspective. Um, right. Before, uh, before I continue, I actually want to start this talk in, on a sad note. Uh, it is with a very heavy heart. I have to uh, share with you something that perhaps some of you already know. Um, on January 
fifth Guy Bressler gave his joint work with his student, Matthew Brennan. Uh, and actually this talk is very much thematically connects to that talk in a way I will explain. It's very sadly, Matthew passed away um, at, uh, at the end of January from health complications. Uh, it was a big blow to us. Uh, he was a fantastic student, a really shining star in the department in the, and leads in ECS. Uh, and he was really as, again, if you've attended the guy's talk uh, on January 25th, it's really exciting, interesting agenda. And among other things, Matthew was a brilliant student. It's a huge, huge loss to us. So I wanted to dedicate this talk to his memory. Um, let me start with the talk. Uh, let me start with the uh, definition of the number partitioning problem. It's actually a very simple problem to define. The problem is like this. We have uh, N items um, with different uh, weights, X1 is so and Xn. Some could be positive, could be negative. The goal is just to simply split them into two groups so that the total weights in two groups are as close to each other as possible uh, in absolute value. So that's, that's the definition. So I here represents a subset of uh, items in one side and I complement here uh, on the other side. So that's the, that's the goal. And I'll say a few words about the background for this problem. Um, just a bit of notation for convenience. It helps to think about this and I hope that, that, that this notation sort of sticks in for the rest of the talk. Um, it helps to think about this as a, as a problem of minimizing the absolute value of the inner product between the vector of weights and the partitioning decisions encoded by minus ones and ones. Right? So we take the inner product of X and uh, any sigma minus one and one in n dimensional vector, and we try to minimize uh, the absolute value. That's the equivalent way of, of defining this problem. Okay, so what do we know about this problem? It is one of the, it's an NP-complete problem in the worst case. Uh, it's one of the six basic NP-complete problems uh, per uh, book by Gary and Johnson. Our setting is the random case, the case where we will be interested primarily in a setting where the weights come from this IIT uh, from some distribution, okay? Uh, and recently this problem has been um, uh, noticed and 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 reemerged uh, in the in the context of in the context of statistics and specifically in the randomized control trials. So I will briefly mention that, but primarily I will not be. This talk is not about randomized control trials, but let me mention what what's the idea. Uh, for that application, for the randomized control trials application, it helps to think about x1 and xn as actually vectors. And think of this as the vectors of different attributes of the N individuals, like their weight, their height, the gender, and things like that. So you have D extends for the number of different attributes. And the goal is to split them into two groups, which will be treated group and the control group, so that the total sum of the attributes in different groups is as close to each other as possible. So, and that can be encoded as follows. So you have uh, now a matrix, uh, D by N, D is a number of features, like three or four, if it's a weight, height, gender, and things like that. N is a number of items. Uh, you partition them in two groups so that the uh, L infinity norm is the smallest. Why L infinity norm? You could instead take L2 norm, it, but for some reasons that people primarily focus, focused on the L infinity norm. Uh, because we, we will be exclusively looking at the case when the dimension is D is one. So it's really not a vector story, it's a numbers story. Okay, and, um, uh, and these are a couple of references that looked at this uh, from the statistics point of view and the mass control uh, trials. Um, okay, there are some older and classical applications of these problems in the scheduling, VLSI design, cryptography and so on and so forth. So what do we know about this problem in the random setting? So in the random setting, uh, and this is the only random setting we will consider in this talk, is when the items come from IID uh, distribution standard normal. So XI are now is a vector of standard normals. And we want to minimize, uh, we want to minimize the uh, solve the partition function. As it turns out, by using fairly simple analysis, and I'll actually sketch the proof of that a little later, it turns out that the objective value of this problem is of the order of magnitude uh, reported here. 
And the key thing here is that this, uh, the discrepancy between the two sums is of the order exponential in n. So it's two to the n, in, uh, two to the negative n. And in fact, the constant here is indeed one. So there's no order here, it's actually minus n. And there is a very simple uh, uh, proof that I will sketch later on why, why this is uh, the case. So what it says is basically, if you have n standard normals, you can split them into two groups such that the total weights are almost identical. The, the discrepancy is ordered two to the negative n. Now, this is the, um, this is the benefit of working with uh, optimization problem in random setting where you can predict the objective value without actually implementing any kind of algorithm. So you know upfront what the objective values has to be. But that's a totally different story if you actually want to propose an algorithm, construct an algorithm that achieves something, something like that. Uh, and this is, uh, um, uh, this has been, has been done. And in fact, the problem in the random setting has been first considered by Karmar Kar Karp uh, in uh, 80s. Um, and then, uh, and what has been um, known from the algorithmic point of view is the following. Uh, several algorithms have been proposed and one of them, which is simplest to describe is largest differences method. And I'll give a verbal quick description of the algorithm gives uh, the objective value, which has logarithm square of the logarithm in the exponent. And that's a big gap if you, uh, between the, uh, uh, between a big, big gap with the exponentially uh, small discrepancy. So algorithmically uh, only log, log squared uh, n in exponent can be achieved. The algorithm is very simple. It's basically the idea is that you, you have n numbers, you sort them in increasing order, take the largest two and replace this largest two with their diff absolute value of their difference. With the idea being that you're always gonna put this largest two items in the different sides. And then a moment of thought re reveals that you don't really need to, you can replace these two numbers by their absolute value. And instead of N numbers, you have N minus one numbers. And then you repeat. And you repeat and repeat, repeat until you get a po total partition. And that turns out to give this value uh, reported here. Okay. And as noted, as I, uh, noted already that it's, it's a big gap between uh, uh, what could be achieved existentially by, uh, for example, doing brute force analysis. And this is where the interesting things uh, begin, at least for us. Uh, because, uh, well, first, nothing better is known. There's no improvement on this algorithm. The references that I mentioned earlier by um, uh, Rigolet and his group and, and Spielman, uh, they consider extension of this problem in higher dimension, but they don't improve uh, and, and they construct analog of the algorithm and the analysis, but they don't improve on the algorithm. So it's still, this bound still stands. So we want to understand it. Okay, um, right. And this is an example of this infamous statistical versus computational gap. This gap, and that's also the type of the gap that uh, Guy uh, discussed, Guy Bressler discussed in his January 25th talk in the same seminar series, where there's a gap between the objective value of some optimization problem you're interested in versus what can be achieved by fast polynomial time algorithms, algorithms that we can understand. Let me pause here and see if you have any questions on about the problem itself, because now I'm gonna go in a broader setting and make some high level remarks. Uh, see um, if you have uh, questions on the problem formulation, the uh, state of the art and things like that. Okay. So I have a quick question. So is the goal yes. to like minimize this objective function with high probability? So this is not like expectation or some other things, right? It's just a- Good. Uh, uh, good. Uh, good. So, um, it would be perfectly fine if you construct an algorithm, for example, that achieves this value uh, in expectation. Uh, that would be pretty much equally hard. Uh, and the reason is that in these settings, often uh, concentrations uh, uh, come sometimes for free, sometimes with a little bit of work. So typically, if you can construct an algorithm that achieves a good value in expectation, 
it's likely that you will be able to show that it achieves that with high probability as well, probability approaching one. There is no like guarantee, it's not some kind of a toolbox uh, that tells you that, but often this is the case. Whenever, when you succeed, you succeed actually with high probability. So feel free to replace this with uh, success measured in expectation. I see. But a, a quick follow-up question, but the complexity yeah. of the algorithm is just the complexity is not like with the high probability, right? Uh, the complexity of the algorithm, uh, the al um, yeah, so we will, we, we will look at the, we want the algorithm that runs in time, which is polynomial in N. Um, or uh, ideally, regard, regardless of the uh, instance. But it, it would be fine if this algorithm was running in polynomial time with high probability as well. That would also be very interesting. So any, these kind of variations on the theme would be fair game as well. Uh, but even this is not, for example, it's not know how to construct an algorithm which runs in polynomial time with high probability and achieves this highlighted value. Still not know. Okay, Good. thanks. Uh, okay, so um, now this is, as, as I said, in some ways, this talk is not about number partitioning problem, but it's just number partitioning problem is just one example of many, many other problems exhibiting this same infamous statistical versus computation gap. And I listed here a, a collection of problems that uh, exhibit a similar phenomena. And the list is growing almost like with this uh, speed of Moore's law. Every year we see uh, one or two uh, extra problems which exhibit, some, which, uh, exhibit something similar. Uh, so we want to understand that. We want to understand um, what drives that. Now, ideally, and in some restricted settings, not applicable here, it is possible to show that if you actually manage to solve this problem in a random setting, you can also solve it in a worst case setting. And therefore, assuming P is not equal to NP, you have, um, you have a hardness statement. We don't have anything like that for the list of problems that I have here and for the number partitioning problem. So we don't even have this benefit of admittedly unproven conjecture, but widely believed that P is not equal to NP. Even this we cannot have. So it's a sad state of uh, affairs where we have apparently hard, apparent hardness where apparent come from the failure of efforts, but we don't have a theory that tells us why, why these problems are hard or exhibits any kind of a formal hardness. So this is where um, some help came along from the statistical physics. Uh, who think about algorithmic hardness in slightly different way. They think about algorithmic hardness more in terms of the geometry of the solution space. And one approach that has been particularly successful in at least ruling out some classes of algorithms and at least provide some evidence of hardness is in the form of the solution space geometry and phase transition. And one particular instantiation of that is the overlap gap property that I will primarily talk about uh, uh, for this problem. So I'll explain what it is. I'll define the pro property. It indeed originates in statistical physics, but no knowledge of statistical physics is needed for this talk. It will be completely self-contained and in fact, very elementary. And I will walk through the property in the context of the number partition and problem. We will see if it's present, if it's not, when is it present, and what are the algorithmic implications uh, of this. So we will see that it, the onset of this property nearly coincides, but not exactly coincides with observed algorithmic hardness. So remember this log squared then versus n in the exponent, we will see that somewhere in between indeed OGP uh, 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 appears. Uh, and we will be able to use it to rule out some classes of algorithms, including Monte Carlo algorithm and another big class of algorithms that I will broadly refer to as stable algorithms. And I will define stable algorithms later on. Um, now, this is just one approach to understanding hardness of these type of problems. 
There are other approaches, one of them already mentioned by uh, Bressler and Brennan. Uh, another direction is by based on so-called low degree polynomials method, and I will not talk about that. The only thing I will say is that in fact, the class of so-called stable algorithm includes as a special case, this class of so-called low degree polynomials. But now I have introduced a whole bunch of uh, you know, terms without ever explaining what they are. So let me now be somewhat more complete. Let me define the overlap gap property. One can define it in pretty much any optimization problem involving uh, random, uh, any optimization problem, but it will be of interest in the case when there is some randomness in the objective function. So we have some objective function L here. It, uh, it's, uh, it depends on variable choice theta. Think of theta as the decision. Like in our case, it's a binary vector. Um, okay, so big theta here is the space of decision. So it will be a binary cube, minus one and one to the n. And by x, I denote here is just a source of randomness. In our case, this is the randomness of the random weights. If it's a random graph, it would be randomness of the underlying random graph. It's a regression problem would be randomness in the in independent and dependent variables, whatever, whatever is the driving randomness of the problem. Uh, so here's the formal definition. It's a little um, perhaps hard to parse in the first round. I'll give you a picture after that to help you, but le let me start with the definition. So we fix a certain parameter M. So we say that overlap gap property holds if, if the following is the case. There is a certain parameter mu. This mu parameter uh, marks the proximity to the optimality. And what it means is that we will be looking at the objective value plus the approximate additive approximation uh, value mu. So we say that the overlap gap property holds if there are two numbers, mu one and mu two, positive numbers, such that for any two vectors decisions, theta one and theta two, which achieve value within mu two optimality, the following is the case. The distance between these two vectors is either at most mu one or at least new two and never in between, okay? Or uh, verbally, oops, what happened? I've lo uh, lost the screen sharing. Yeah, yeah. We oh, I don't know why this happened. I apologize for that. Let me try again. Uh, let me try this. Hmm. Let me try again. I, I'm really terribly sorry about that. No problem. Okay. It's a good pause for questions, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Natural pause. Uh, okay. Uh, right. Okay. Let me. Hmm. Okay, so I think we're back yep. and let me just make it full screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and okay. I, I think you, I, you want me to make it a little smaller like this, right? And the bigger is better. <laughs> a bigger is better, okay, yeah. bigger is better. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so um, if you have some questions about that, perhaps let's hold on with that uh, and uh, wait until I give a picture and and then if there are still some questions, then, then I'll, I'll pause and answer that. So verbally, basically it says that all mu optimal solutions, all solutions which are close to the uh, objective value are either close to each other, pairs of solutions are either close to each other or far from each other and not in, in between. And this uh, can look at some as something like this. So this is, so here we have a plot, stylized plot of the objective function L. Uh, theta admittedly is not one dimensional. It's typically uh, n-dimensional, but for what it's worth, you have the solution space, uh, which is very rugged, up and down, very non-convex, very uh, lots of uh, local minimums. 
somewhere there's objective value achieved here or on this point. So what we do is we draw some distance to optimality mu that partitions this space of solutions into some chunks. Um, so overlap gap property says that the distance between solutions within its chunk is smaller than the distance between the chunks, so to speak. Okay, so you have this kind of clustering of solutions and within each cluster, these distances are diameter of each cluster is smaller than the distance between uh, clusters. And just to contrast it with a different picture, if you have something like this, which is still a very rugged landscape, uh, but in this case, the, the, this diameter of clusters is larger than the distance between clusters. And what it means is that if you were to sort of list out all the distances between pairs of mu optimal solutions, you will cover the entire interval. Uh, so that would be an example where you, you do not have the overlap gap property. Whereas here it would be example where you do. So let me pause here and see if you have, if there are any questions. Uh, David, I have a question, it's Venkat. Yes, hi Venkat. Hi, how's it going? I was just wondering what uh, what do you assume about the dependency of new one on new? Right. So this is um, this is all problem dependent. Uh, mu um, the the larger you can mu to make and uh, for which you still have this property you hold, the better because you can rule out as we will see presence of mu pretty much rules out algorithms which achieve uh, value better than mu. So the larger is mu, the stronger is the statement. It's really problem dependent. There will be concrete mu instantiation of mu for the number partitioning problems. So we can talk about that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. um, uh, in this definition, how important is the fact that uh, we are looking at a discrete optimization problem as opposed to continuous optimization? The capital theta being discrete versus continuous, does it matter at all? Uh, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, but of course, all, this definition is only as useful as, as they, it's us being able to use it in some applications. One interesting application that, that uh, I can describe is the is indeed continuous application, is the so-called it sounds fancy spherical piece spin glass model. Basically, it's a problem of optimizing multivariate polynomial with Gaussian coefficients on a sphere. And that turns out to be extremely rugged, has a rugged landscape. And indeed, in, indeed it exhibits the, this overlap gap property that can be used to rule out some algorithms like Langevin dynamics. That would be a different talk, but I mean that, uh, yes, there are, this is interesting in continuous optimization as well. Thanks. But of course, our ability to prove something like that highly depends on the certain symmetry of the underlying problem. Like there is a IID, weights and things like that, like it's a random graph and things. Like, so it's uh, it's not like I can go to a concrete practical problem with, with concrete data and, 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 and I can perhaps numerically observe some OGP property there. I think that would be interesting, but it's not like I can a priori prove it because we need some stylized assumptions like IID and things like that. Okay, good. Uh, uh, so, all right, so it's, it, it, please continue asking questions. So uh, with that said, let me describe where, in what form and shape indeed the overlap gap property uh, takes place in the number partitioning problem. And the first the result that I'm going to state is actually uh, rather simple, although it's incomplete in terms of the coverage of the parameters. So first uh, it's convenient to, let's so go back to the setting where XIs are IID. It will be convenient to renormalize the weights so that the variances are one over n because in that case, the objective value is just uh, two to the negative n. This pesky square root n disappears by a trivial rescaling. That's, that's not a big deal. Now, here's a statement. Uh, it it's, uh, might be hard to parse, so I'll walk with you and then I'll, I'll, I'll describe it more in more informal terms. Basic, well, let me start informally. Basically, it says that the uh, or overlap gap property in a way I have just introduced does hold uh, up to the exponent uh, n over two. Now, remember the objective value has exponent n. 
So what we're saying here is that actually it does hold up to the level n over two. And now let me make it more precise. So pick any alpha in the interval between one half and one. In other words, some are strictly larger than one half, but smaller than one, one being the optimum. Uh, for any such alpha, there exists a parameter nu such that the following is the case. If you have two partitions, if you have two partitions, ah, I wouldn't highlight one, two partitions, sigma and tau, for the same collection of weights, x1 and xn, which achieve value uh, with exponent alpha n, then the following is the case. Either their distance normalized naturally by, uh, by square root n, well, I'm taking square here, we have n-dimensional binary vectors, so the length is always uh, of order uh, n, length is of order n, so we normalize by n. So either the distance is at least new, or in fact, they have to be identical. Uh, okay, so that, that turns out to be the case. So what it means is that the partitions which achieve that good of a value, two to the negative negative, uh, two to the negative alpha n are, are like spikes. So they're like, uh, different spikes in the, uh, in the uh, n-dimensional vector with a significant uh, distance between them. Or if I went to go back to the, uh, this picture, it basically says that instead of the clusters here, you just have one spike, one, 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 one solution, clusters consisting of uh, one point. Okay, so that's, um, uh, that's what it says. Um, any questions? I'm about to give a very short proof of that. In fact, as perhaps surprisingly, it's not hard to show. Okay, so let me do a proof sketch. As the saying goes that every talk should contain a, a, a proof and a joke and those should be separate. Uh, so proof is here, joke is coming later. Uh, okay, so let's start with the proof. Um, in fact, it's just a straightforward union bound goes as this. One thing to observe is that once you fix a partition sigma and take the inner product, this is just a standard normal, right? Remember x, the I, x, I, x vector is iid, we renormalize the vari variance by uh, one of us root n. So this is just standard normal, good. And now let's fix two partitions, sigma and tau with the prescribed uh, distance equal to new. When you do that, you effectively, with two partitions, you create two normals, which are correlated. And the value of correlation is parameterized by new, naturally. I right? say so one binary vector, another binary vector, you both of them are hit with this Gaussian vector. So you have correlated, two correlated Gaussians. Let's ask uh, the following. What is the probability that both Gaussians in absolute value fall in this tiny interval which is exponentially small. Now the observation is that this is described by joint density of covariated uh, Gaussians. The observation is that because the interval is small, it's dominated by the density at zero. So you just have to take the density at zero, which is practically one of a square root two pi and multiply by the area that we're interested in. And this area is a square with a side length two to the negative alpha n, okay? So this is just, you know, integrating Gaussian, uh, two-dimensional Gaussian in a tiny interval around zero. And the exponent, uh, the dominating term here is the exponent twice alpha n, because twice because of the square here. Okay, so that means that that's the likelihood of two partitions achieving very good value. Um, what about the total number of such partitions? Well, it's also easy to compute because you have two to the n choices for the first partition, but the second partition has a prescribed distance to the first one. So you have only limited number of choices, which is controlled by, by the binary entropy. How many other binary vectors you can have, which are this prescribed distance from the uh, starting on sigma. And then now we just put two things together and by, whoops, um, if you choose new um, small enough so that the exponent here alpha and two alpha and beats 
this quantity, then, then you're done. And you can always do that because two alpha is larger than one because alpha is larger than a half. And that explains the n over two being a barrier for that, okay? Um, I have a quick right. question. So, yes. Uh, so the probability, uh, you took it as product of both the probabilities, right? But they're not independent, like sigma and x tau are not independent. So why is it square? Oh, uh, it's not, it, they're not independent, but it, it's square because it's dominated. Um, I'm sorry, there is a constant factor. There is another constant factor missing here, which is comes from the correlation of sigma and tau. I, it should be up to the order of magnitude. Okay. But the dominated term is just the area and that's a square of the side length. So very good. Good right. catch, Siva. I appreciate that. And that's the artifact of me giving this talk uh, for the first time. So basically, basically going back perhaps to the to the um, uh, statement and this kind of spikes, it it represents an interesting situation where you, if you achieve one partition, which is really good, it gives you exponentially small discrepancy. Uh, and if you want to construct another one of starting from this uh, one that's already good, it basically means that you cannot do that by shuffling just a couple of items here and there. You really have to rearrange order n items in, in the partition in order to get yet another good partition. And that's, that's, that's the picture that comes up from here. Okay, so, all right. so I hope I convince you that this is actually fairly straightforward uh, to, 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 pro to, to prove that um, this fact, but uh, this doesn't get, um, yeah, this doesn't get us all the way to the log squared n, which is the algorithmically achievable bound. And sadly, uh, this approach that I've described is tight in the following sense. Uh, and here's the formal statement, but here's what it says informally. It says that if you look at the objective value larger than two to the ne negative n over two, provably this picture I've described does not hold. On the contrary, you can construct pairs of partitions which achieve targeted value and have any inner product any distance between them that you want with some approximation. So it means that for any alpha now, which is smaller than a half, right? And for any distance new, you can find two partitions, sigma uh, and tau, both achieving good value in uh, a good objective value and with the distance between them equal to new. So this approach for, for looking at pairwise distances and establishing OGP probably fails in this case. Yet we're still pretty far from the algorithmically achievable bound. So that's what I need to bridge further. That's one thing. The other thing is that we need to, I need to say something about the algorithm. We can establish all kinds of properties like OGP all day, all we want, but what is the implication for, for algorithm? And that's what I want to do in the rest <laughs> of the talk. David, I have a question, Venkat. Yes. So, uh, so in this result that you have on the slide up here, is there something you can say about the nature of the partitions that have this property? I mean, is there some sense in which they are special or non-generic or something like that? That uh, like, um, I'm not sure. It's just a, it's just a slice of the solution space which corresponds to the good values. And if you look at the pairwise distances, you can realize all pairwise uh, distances. Other than that, not sure I can say. Maybe you have something. Intuitively, they need to be aligned somehow to the empirical statistics of the realization of X. So I was thinking if there's something intelligent to say about that. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So for what it's worth, I can, I can say perhaps this. First, we don't know, it's a good question. But one thing we're trying to understand is that uh, if to what extent something like low degree polynomials actually uh, work in the problem like this. And the low degree polynomials, you can think of it as projections of this vector X to some low dimensional space so that might actually reveal some kind of a structure that you're describing. So I would say perhaps work in progress. We very much would like to understand uh, what, what's, what's happening there. 
uh, that might reveal. Maybe also statistical physicists have, which who have looked at this problem uh, also quite a bit also have something to say, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid this is the limit of my, uh, what okay, I can thank say you. here. Yeah. Okay, so, right, so, so let's continue. Well, what we have covered thus far is still some, is so, some are good. For example, this, using this picture I have described with spikes and large distances between this, this kind of spikes, achieving good solution. You can use that already to rule out the success of Markov chain Monte Carlo type methods. I will not describe details of the in, in, intended uh, algorithm here, but uh, it's a fairly standard uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, sometimes called the Glauber dynamics. And you can show that it will mix in time, which is exponential. So you cannot, you, you can't hope to use it as a good contender uh, for finding good partitions. Okay. Uh, but what about other algorithms? That's what we want to say. And as I said, there is still a significant gap between n over two and log squared n. So, uh, so now I'm going to describe uh, an elevated version of the multi overlap uh, of the overlap gap property, which is called the multi overlap gap property. And I'll say it sort of I uh, I'll I'll do that with the fingers crossed. I think the OGP for pairs of solutions that have been introduced. I hope it's fairly intuitive. I've described you the picture, landscape, distances. It's fairly intuitive, geometric, and so on. The multi-OGP version uh, is less, far less intuitive. But we need something to rule out algorithms, so I'll, I'll, I'll proceed. And, and, but naturally, I'll go a bit slower to give a chance to, for you to parse it and so on. So here's, let me, to, uh, sort of jump jump to the proof, but walk you through the details. First, um, we're gonna be, uh, first it helps to perhaps to look here. We're gonna be looking at solutions, achieving value of this order growing faster than square root n log n. So we're gonna be looking at partitions that achieve value of roughly two to the negative square root n. So square root of n much larger than log squared n, but smaller than n, so somewhere in between. And this is pretty much the limit of what, where we can go. We cannot beat that. Okay, so we'll look at partitions achieving value two to the, uh, this exponent. Uh, and now instead of taking two partitions, we're gonna take m partitions. And m is carefully chosen for the proof to, to go through. So we're gonna be looking roughly on the order square root n partitions which achieve this objective value. So suppose we take M of them, which achieve this value. The claim is that there exist two numbers, new one, new two, which depend on N, but still in some, uh, give something trivial with the following property. If you have M such partitions, at least one pair should have a distance outside of this interval. Or to put it differently, when, when, you, when you have this kind of multiple M solutions achieving this value, at least one pair, you can, they cannot all have distances falling into this prohibited interval that I've described. At least one of them should fall outside. If you look at this definition, when, when M is, at this property, when M is equal to two, this is precisely what I've described above. So you have two solutions and their distance cannot be in between. It's either at most new one or at least new two. So here, if you have M of them, at least one pair should fall outside. And this admittedly is not a very natural definition, but this is what we can work with. So once again, informally, we can't find M partitions, all with values uh, at most that much, and all pairwise distances in this prohibited interval. And this is what we refer to the uh, multi overlap gap property. I'll give you a bit, bit of a history of where this is coming from. And now uh, I'm gonna, sh okay, before you, while you're parsing this, I'm gonna shell shock you if, with something even harder than that. But I promise that my co complexity of the definitions and, and statements will stop at that level. Uh, in fact, let me pause here now if, and see if you have any questions? Uh, 
is there a hardness result that corresponds to multi ogp similar to how you said that if you have ogp mcmc wouldn't work yes uh and that's the idea and that's the, perhaps the punchline that is coming in about 5 minutes probably that's that, that's the punchline yeah another that question all, all Uh, I, I wanted to say that uh, all of all of these st- sort of structures. This is just describes the structure of solution space. As something is possible, something is impossible. Doesn't say anything about algorithms per se. But all of this is done geared towards to r- ruling out algorithms. So that's coming. Yeah, go ahead, Siva. You wanted to. Um, so for OGP, you said that MCMC type of algorithms wouldn't work. So is the conjecture that uh, no other algorithms would work? is that the reason one looks at ogp because if it's just uh, a- right maybe i should I, i i intended to say that but maybe i didn't say it explicitly uh the idea is that indeed these problems mar- might be hard in this regime probably starting from log square then who knows but we cannot prove it even conditionally that p is not equal to np so we try to give further and further evidence of this hardness So the mantra of the OGP based approach is that you prove some kind of a, a structure like OGP and use it to rule out some classes of algorithms. Uh, and with the belief that in fact probably perhaps no polynomial time algorithms even exist. Okay. Okay. This yes. okay so let me describe another uh, variant of it and uh, you don't have to follow the, all the details of that but just want to give you a flavor. So another variant of it, which we call the ensemble uh, multi-OGP, uh, it basically extends this the property, the multi-overlap gear property, to this collection of correlated instances, and that's that's the idea, and that will be important for the proof. So now instead of one vector x of weights, we're going to consider m plus one vectors. Uh, at the beginning these instances are independent so now we have inst- we have m plus 1 instances of problems that we need to solve they are independent but and then what we do is we create create correlated instances where we start with the starting instances x0 and start correlated uh, correlating x0 with each one of the instances independ- uh, independently by some parameterization tau So, and, uh, right. So, uh, and it's described like this. So that way you create uh, M plus, uh, you create M kind of paths going from X zero to each one of these uh, instances. Key thing to note here is that the parameterization is such that for each fixed tau, this is still a Gaussian vector, IID Gaussian vector. If you look at the marginal of this uh, Y of tau, it's a vector. And it has IID uh, uh, normal uh, entries because of the choice of the weights tau and sort of a straightforward check of the uh, variances uh, reveals uh, that. Okay, so we have correlated instances. So you one can sort of a cartoon picture of it is is, is like this. So you start with x zero, you have independent instances x one, x n, and from x zero you sort of gradually move to each one of these instances in this way. So. Uh, If you look at this, it, admittedly, it looks like when I was creating this slide, my wife looked over, over my shoulder and said, what is this, some kind of a menorah, incomplete menorah symbol or some, something like that. And uh, yeah, for what it's worth, I will refer to it now as an incomplete menorah. That's a promised joke, by the way, that's that I promised to deliver. At some point, this is the joke. Uh, so this incomplete menorah describes describes the kind of a gradual transition from one instance to, to M other independent instances. Okay, good. So the ensemble multi-OGP uh, uh, property for, for this number partition problem says the following, that whatever I said earlier also holds, if you look at the instances across uh, this, uh, is this pass. Um, so we take, Um, and, and so I've marked the difference between this th- previous statement by, um, by red color Y. So let me go through that. Um, so we're going we're gonna to look at the value of the partitions achieved at instances Y of tau at some marked time tau, which marks time between uh, original instance and uh, ith instance. Uh, 
we, we take some interval, I here can, corresponds to some kind of a discretization. So we think of tau not evolving continuously, but over small discrete steps. And the property says that even if you take partitions which achieve uh, partitions which achieve good values, but even across different instances, even they cannot be uh, satisfy the property that all distances are falling to this interval. That at least m of them, even corresponding to different instances, still should have a property that at least one distance falls outside of this interval. Okay, and that's uh, I I realize this is a harder uh, uh, harder. Um, property to wrap your mind, uh, mind around. And didn't come, this kind of uh, property didn't come overnight. I, I'll, I'll explain, I'll give a bit brief of a background later on. So across interpolated instances, solution partitions achieving a good value have the property that at least one pair of partitions falls outside of this interval. Um, I'm gonna switch gears now and describe the class of algorithms uh, we can rule out by uh, the structure, but let me pause again and see if you have any questions. Uh, hi, David, I have a question, it's Ganesh. Hi, Ganesh. Hey, uh, so you're asking, uh, so roughly your high dimensional Gaussian is on the unit sphere, right? In n dimensions. And you're asking which point on the hypercube minimizes the inner product, the which vertex of the hypercube? Yes. Could, could you say the other way around? Can, can you say which parts of the sphere, if you look at the shapes of parts of the sphere, which minimize for each given vertex of the hypercube, do we know anything what that shape would look like? So let, let me add, uh, understand again. again. Uh, so you you fix you fix a partition. Uh, let me understand your question. Yeah, again. yeah. You fix a partition. So you fix a mm -hmm. vertex on the hypercube and ask which uh, what mm -hmm. parts of the sphere would. I see. So basically, you're asking. So fix a partition. What can we say about? Um, vector of Gaussians when you condition that the corresponding uh, discrepancy value is very small. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so this is like conditioning the vector of Gaussians to have a small discrepancy. Yeah, maybe something can be said about that. I'm not sure I have to think, uh, but that's, yeah, that's, that's, a different pro that's a different problem. Okay, okay, thanks. Good. Uh, Okay, so let's, uh, that's a different and interesting problem. I, I have just a little caught, a little of God, I haven't thought, thought about that. So let me describe the class of algorithms that can be ruled out by this multi OGP ensemble period. And then, and then I will wrap up. Uh, broadly speaking, we will describe those, call these algorithms a stable for a very, very natural reason. Well, first we think of algorithm as simply now a mapping between the instance X to the partition sigma. So in that sense, it doesn't even matter whether the algorithm is polynomial time, not polynomial time, the details of the underlying Turing machine or whatever, the great, whatever details of the algorithms are uh, that underlie that is irrelevant. It's just a mapping from instance to the partitions. And we call it stable if it satisfies the following property. Loosely speaking, informally, it says that if you perturb your instance, this vector of weights, just a little bit, then it's not gonna change your partition significantly. So you have original instance and different weights, you, you map it to your partition, fine, and then you perturb it. Some of the weights increased by 1%, some of the weights decreased by 2%, things like that. Uh, and then you look at the implied change in your partition. So you call it stable if this, this only maybe a few uh, items have been reshuffled. Other than that, uh, they stay the same. So here's a formal definition that gives this probabilistic kind of tail form. Details are not super important. Basically it says that, okay, if you have two correlated Gaussians, X and Y, uh, so Y of tau, remember, is correlated with X, so tau controls the correlation. If 
the distance, uh, if the output is not much larger than the L2 norm of the distance plus some additive factor, and that uh, with a high likelihood as n goes to infinity. And again, this is tuned out, this definition is tuned out for, for us uh, for, to, to be implementable in the setting that we described. But intuitively, it just says that your algorithm is not terribly sensitive to the input. Uh, we try to prove the conjecture that this algorithm that achieves the uh, log squared n in the exponent is stable in that definition. We couldn't do that. That turned out to be hard. So I'm going to leave it as a very interesting open question. Conjecture is that largest differences method is stable uh, in, this, in the sense of this definition, and maybe in the sense of any definition. We uh, did David, verify it. Go, yeah. Sorry, just a clarification question on your definition. Is the probability on both the randomness in X and in the creation of Y of tau from X, or is it conditioned on X? Uh, in both. Ah, okay, both. because uh, if you condition on X, it's probably too strong, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, condition on X is probably too strong because it will be a sort of like a worst case. And yeah, it's- so the, no the notion of stability is probably too strong a concept if you condition on X. Because you, you probably find you'd have certain realizations that you have to make large changes to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It will be like a worst case uh, setting. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, this is, this is just a, this is with respect to both randomness of X and Y. So both are genuinely Gaussian with the prescribed correlation. Uh, it's okay if the algorithm uses some internal randomness uh, with it. That's not gonna, ch it shouldn't change much uh, uh, this. Unfortunately, we couldn't prove that it's uh, uh, stable, uh, but numerically it seemed, uh, it seemed to be the case. So we will proceed under the assumption that at least interesting algorithms in the settings are stable. But something else that has been, uh, that has been shown in the earlier work of my, with uh, Jagannath and Wayne, is that it turns out that low degree polynomials appropriately defined based algorithms appropriately defined, I'm not gonna do that in this talk, are in fact a stable algorithm by generic properties of low degree polynomials having low noise uh, in sensitivity and things like that. But that would be a subject of a different talk. Let me not go there. So at least there's some interesting algorithms uh, that uh, are ruled out by the stability property. Many others, uh, okay. And then the, basically the punchline, and I'm gonna wrap up uh, around uh, this punchline, the punchline is that um, indeed uh, the ensemble uh, multi overlap gap property implies that stable algorithm cannot achieve better value better than something. Now this something is not exactly where the uh, OGP appears. It's OGP appears at square root n log n. Uh, we have to go a little higher exponent, but it's still sub exponential. So somewhere in between for, for technical reasons. And the only, um, so now, now let me make a couple of comments. So the idea of using multi overlap gap property, uh, it did not, as I said, is not did not emerge over, overnight. It's sort of kind of uh, through uh, several efforts. Uh, we have used it in, in a different setting with uh, in the paper with Mother Sudan on the constra random constraint satisfaction problem. And recently Alex Wine very nicely implemented the same idea for the problem of studying uh, independent sets in random graphs also use the multi overlap gap property to rule out some classes of algorithms like low degree polynomials. Uh, but perhaps an interesting and salient feature of the proof technique uh, is that in this setting, we're using the uh, ideas based on the Ramsey theory in combinatorics. Uh, and this is uh, when, when I will admit when, when, uh, when Aaron brought to me this idea, I said, this is, sounds very fishy. It sounds like it has no relevance to what we're doing here. But it, the, as often is the case, students are right and advisors are wrong. Um, I'll, um, I'll tell you what the Ramsey property is very loosely speaking. Some of many of you might have seen it uh, before. Ramsey property is basically in this, this setting, concrete setting that we, uh, we need is, is basically says something like this. If you have a dense enough graph and if you color the edges of this uh, graph with some different collection of colors, at least large enough subset of these nodes will be a completely connected monochromatic subset. 
Uh, and you just need to put the right bounds on the things. So if you have Q colors, like Q is like three colors, black, red, blue, and green. And if the graph has dense enough in the sense that the largest independent set is at most something, then the graph contains a monochromatic peak. Okay, this is completely from a different world of extremal combinatorics. What's the relevance of, of this? The relevance of this I'll describe in the collection of pictures and then I'll stop. Um, so the collection of picture uh, works like this. So remember uh, this undercomplete menorah, now we have overcomplete menorah. So we have a collection of instances which have a ground instance X0, a bunch of independent instances, and we call in a correlated way sort of emerge, uh, interpolate to that. Um, by, the, uh, by the overlap here property, uh, oh no, first we eliminate paths, uh, pairs of paths in which the corresponding pairs of solutions jump over this interval. Now, this is still possible, but with uh, by, by the overlap here property, it's extremely unlikely, but it might happen. So some of them have to be pruned. And then you have the rest of the menorah, which is, which is, uh, which has the property of the uh, OGP that I've described. The next thing to do is that to mark pairs as uh, with times when they enter this prohibited uh, interval. Uh, so if it, one enters a time 30 second, uh, time like uh, 0.32, it's a red color. If it enters a time 0.48, it's a green color and things like that. Number of colors corresponds to the number of discretization points. And the last step is to observe is that if the number of instances is large enough, by Ramsey property, there will be collection of uh, uh, solutions and therefore pairs where all of this happens all at the same time, let's say 0 0.34, and that contradicts the uh, overlap gap property. That, that's basically a flavor of this. So, so Ramsey theory is used to, to say that if you have a large collection of independent instances and paths going to the instances, at some point for some subsets of instances, you can create those M solutions with pairwise distances uh, all realized in U1 and U2. And that's a contradiction to overlap gap property and therefore it's not possible. That's the kind of a gist of the argument. This is all I wanted to say. I have some concluding thoughts here, but since I went over time, I'll let you sort of go over them. Uh, 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 offline, there's nothing remarkable I, want to say, I wanted to say here, just to summarize what I've done in this talk and still pose the grand challenge of ideally showing worst case hardness of the problems like random number partitioning problem or any other problems in this longer, longer and ever growing list. Thank you very much for your attention. It was fun. Thank you very much, David. I'll clap on behalf of all the others. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, do people have more questions? I think, uh, David, are you good like for staying for a few more minutes? For yes, people? yeah, yeah, I, I, as I planned, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. <clears throat> so David, I have a question. Um, yeah. So could you say something about how these techniques might apply to uh, larger classes of problems? Are they specific to the particular problem that you discussed? Uh, they have been applied to larger class of problems, uh, but there has not been, maybe that would be a good idea to sort of describe some kind of a general class of problems and then sort of specialize to instances. But so far it has been more like an approach being used in, in, in uh, random graphs uh, like planted click it, uh, has been used for planted click has been used for the random constraint satisfaction problem like random case at type problem co coloring of the graph independent sets clicks things uh, things like that lots of problems in in statistics uh, exhibits similar as as what guy has described in his talk, like uh, sparse covariance matrix, uh, my spike tensor model and, and things like that. What is important in this is that somehow you have enough symmetry a priori about the problem to being able to predict the objective value non-constructively. That, that's, that's the key thing. Uh, the question was more, more specific to the, what you've done here, which is presumably to use this 
multi OGP property to exclude the possibility that certain classes of algorithms could achieve the statistical limit, right? So uh, are you saying that that has been done in various other classes of problems for specific algorithms? Was that- uh, oh, oh yeah, yes, that's that's what I, 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 I'm, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't very explicit about oh, that. Okay. So, uh, so Alex Wine has used that to show, use this similar property to rule out low degree polynomials based algorithm to find independent set in sparse random graphs. Uh, we have used it uh, for the random constraint satisfaction problem. I should have mentioned perhaps the first instantiation of the multi, the first instantiation of OGP ruling out algorithms was done, I believe by me and, 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 and Madhu Sudan for the local algorithm in sparse graphs. And the multi OGP version was introduced by Raman and Virag and now I realize I should have mentioned that uh, side of this work as well. And they're all based, yes, on, the, all based on Ramsey theory ideas. Oh, no, that's, that's the interesting thing. So I think all of them, yeah, they, they use the, all, the argument that says that if you have OGP, then algorithm fails. All of the prior uh, results were you're not using Ramsey theory, but they were using some kind of a concentration inequality. Uh, arguments, which we, we didn't have here. So I think the usage of the Ramsey theory is the novel in this uh, case that I, I credit Aaron for, for coming up with that. Thank you. So do people have other questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank David again for the great talk. Thank you, David. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Lots of very nice questions during the talk. I appreciate that. Um, good to see you all and see you in some future seminars. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.